everyone. My name is Boston Bradley, and I am a junior at education major at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. I want to officially welcome you to our education law policy and ethics class event, civics education in the 21st century. In our class, we encourage participation even when we are virtual. We respect everyone and their ideas and differences are always welcome. We ask classmates to be respectful. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Raymond Radley, Chair of Social Sciences and Business and Enterprises Division. Professor Radley teaches American government and politics. Our education course begins with a focus on governing schools. We are delighted that you all could join us for this conversation. Dr. Radley. Thank you, Boston. I want to join Boston and Beth Specker from the Rendell Center and welcoming everybody who's joining us today from across the Commonwealth. And I can see that we're up over 90 participants and that's really a, a good turnout for this Monday afternoon. Uh, today's topic is important and timely. The public health emergency of the last year has disrupted education across the country in significant ways. We have also experienced something of a civic health emergency that has left many citizens vulnerable to the viral spread of disinformation and that has challenged our shared commitment to democratic values. I wanna thank Dr. Zer uh, Jerry Zahorchak for organizing this forum along with the students in his class. Uh, Dr. Zahorchak served as Secretary of Education in the Rundell administration and as superintendent for several school districts across the Commonwealth. And of course, he currently serves so effectively for us as the chair of the education division uh, at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. I also wanna thank Governor Rendell who will join us shortly and Judge Rendell for their long careers as public servants and for the work they do through the Rendell Center to promote civics education and civic engagement. Uh, they've been very generous with their time to join us today and generous with the uh, resources and staff of the Rendell Center, including its executive director, Beth Specker. In, in other times, we would have hosted this forum from the John P. Murtha Center for Public Service and National Competitiveness on our campus. I know Representative Murtha was a friend of the Rendells and a great champion for Johnstown and the nation. Uh, he was especially committed to expanding opportunities in education and public service for young people. The Murtha Center is located on the Pitt Johnstown campus because of the leadership of our president, uh, Dr. Jim Spector. Uh, Dr. Spector not only shares Jack Murtha's commitment to public service, but his leadership and his vision uh, have been so important and so effective in making Pitt Johnstown a leading educational institution in the Northeast. And his role and his impact and his leadership have been recognized not just across the state, but across the country. And I'd like to invite Dr. Spector to make a couple of welcoming comments as well. You're muted in there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rabley, and uh, I want to also thank uh, Governor Rendell, who is a very good, great friend of the, really of the state, but of Johnstown, and particularly the University of Pittsburgh, Johnstown. And um, I want to thank uh, Judge Rendell and the Rendell Center and Beth, and also welcome to all the students and educators around the state, and particularly Dr. Zahorchak. This event is especially timely and has a high degree of urgency. There is urgency because the whole question of adherence and fidelity to American ideals and institutions and values is of the highest importance. And civics education, especially at this time, is a way to assure that we can continue to sustain those ideals. For nearly 250 years, Americans, has done, Americans have done the, the great work of building a society based on laws, on institutions, and ideals. The journey has not been perfect, but the ideals have been perfect. The ideas have been perfect ideas. Ideas of equality, of liberty, of dignity, of justice for all. In recent years, and recently in particular, these ideals have been tested. They've come under question, they've been questioned. In some cases, the ideals have come under attack. 
some people are doubting those ideals in the midst of a social justice crisis that we just experienced recently, some wondered whether these ideals still matter, whether our institutions are still relevant. Some have felt excluded from the American experiment and from the American democratic project. So there is urgency as we gather here today to talk about civics education because people are asking, are our institutions strong enough? Are they resilient? Would they buckle under pressure? Can we survive with these institutions in a divided nation? Do we all share the same truths when we say we hold these truths to be self-evident? Well, are those truths just so for red states or are they different for blue states? What does it mean that we hold together as a people truths to be self-evident? That really is a fundamental question that civics education, that's why it's so important at this time and has always been important. So I think that despite our challenges, despite the, you know some of the skeptics, American ideals and institutions continue to hold and they do so because of the vitality of public schools in educating students about those ideals, in promoting civic dialogue, in promoting conversations, in teaching and cultivating the habits of citizenship through civics education. So for our part, we are just delighted and honored to, be, to play a small part in uh, hosting this event because Civics education is fundamentally how we sustain a great republic. It is through civics education that the ideals continue to live on for another generation. We keep the republic as Ben Franklin suggested. We keep it through you know, the dialogue in civics classes, through the coming together as citizens and discussing what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a member of a community, of a republic a place where we could hash out our differences, not through violence, but through dialogue, not through cynicism, but acknowledging each other through debate and with respectful dialogue. And by so doing, we too would play our part to sustain this Republic and to continue to build that more perfect union. So in short, there is nothing I can think of more important at this point in the nation's history than a vigorous dialogue about civics education, the relevance of civics, the relevance of our constitution, the importance of our constitutional project, which is to build a more perfect union of all the people, not for the wealthy, but for all the people, for the powerful, but for all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Spector. Um, thank you, Governor Rundell, for joining. Um, besides the distinguished public servants, uh, Judge Rundell and Governor Rundell, uh, joining us today on our panel, we're fortunate to have three experienced uh, Pennsylvania educators, civics uh, educators, who not only grapple with some of the philosophical and abstract issues that we just touched on, but have to figure out a way to, to implement those in the classroom and, and, and manipulate them, their, manage their way through um, the rules and regulations imposed by government. So joining us today, uh, we have Christian Rabley. He's an eighth grade civics teacher with the Greater Johnstown School District. Mr. Rabley is a past recipient of the Pennsylvania Council of Social Studies Teacher of the Year Award. Um, and he was last year's uh, Duquesne University School of Education Distinguished uh, Alumnus. Um, and full disclosure, he's also my son. Um, Rob Heinrich uh, is joining us also. Uh, Mr. Heinrich is Director of Education for the Indiana Area School District. Uh, he's a former school principal, uh, social studies teacher, and he's also a distinguished alumnus of Pitt Johnstown. Um, Joe Welch is an eighth grade civics teacher with the North Hills School District in Pittsburgh. Uh, he was named uh, 
Pennsylvania Teacher of the Year last year by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. And in 2018, he was named as National History Teacher of the Year by the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. So we've got some um, skilled and experienced uh, civics educators to help us uh, talk a bit about um, education in the classroom. And I wanna start off um, by asking uh, Mr. Rabley the question, uh, can you begin by telling the audience about Pennsylvania's uh, standards and expectations for civics education and your view as a civics uh, educator? Sure. Thank you, um, Dr. Adley, and to everybody at Pitt Johnstown who worked hard to pull this together and have this great idea to, to arrange this conversation. And the Rendells and everybody working hard at the Rendell Center, um, taking time, and the panelists and all, the, all of our guests as well. I'm very excited for this. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to hear from everybody. It's caused me to have a lot of conversations with the people that I surround myself with about what it means to improve civics education. I've heard so many awesome ideas coming from all over the place. Um, so I think that's kind of where this all begins. But what do Pennsylvania standards say about civics education? I will focus on the most recent uh, act, I guess, signed in 2018 by Governor Wolf. And this act requires schools to administer a locally developed assessment of US history, government, and civics at least one time during grades seven through 12. And it says schools should determine uh, the form of the assessment and the manner in which that, that assessment is um, administered. And it also gives the possibility of using the citizenship test as, as an assessment as well. This act also requires PDE to post on their website a toolkit to help facilitate these testing requirements. So the toolkit does have some teacher voice in it, which I love to see. I think teachers and, and civics teachers need to be in the driver's seat or at least have a, a seat at this table. And that, that toolkit has sample questions for what, uh, what can be on this, this assessment. And it also has tons of action groups and organizations so if you're looking to activate your students beyond just the test, um, it has things like Special Olympics, 4-H, Habitat for Humanity, Rotary and Interact Clubs, and it has project ideas for building civic skills. Some excellent ones that we have and that Pitt Johnstown uses like Model UN, National History Day, and iCivics. Um, so starting this year, schools will be required to report all of that data back to Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, what type of assessment did you administer? How many students took your assessment? How many students passed your assessment? And what grade level was your assessment administered in? Now, Joe and I were, have been talking about this and I think that's a great start. So what is my view on this? I think it's a decent start. Um, I think it gets social studies and civics education on the map a little bit. Um, but if you're giving, if it's locally developed and if it's offered, it has to be required either from seventh through 12th grade. We would like to see um, more priority, I guess, and, and a continuity of that. So a yearly consistent effort um, investing in civics education. Massachusetts actually passed a similar law in 2018 and it has similar requirements, but they also created a civics project trust fund and they their, Cong their state Congress um, voted to dedicate $1.5 million to supporting the initiative and the launch. So I don't think that, it's, that civics education is a problem that necessarily requires throwing money at, but it is, if we wanna take it seriously, there are costs involved in that. There are excellent educators and voices. Um, and if we're talking about intellectual property and efforts, there's money that needs to be invested in taking this seriously. Um, so that's something that I would like to see as well. But just in general, this conversation today is everything that I think needs to happen. When I think of our country and our democracy and our self-government, um, it looks like ordinary people identifying a problem or an opportunity and putting their heads together and saying, what can we do about it? And that's, that's why we're here today. And um, I think we all believe that we can do something about the future of civics education. And we believe in America and this, 
great unfinished symphony, as the Hamilton folks would say. Um, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and founder of iCivics said, civics education is not transferred through the gene pool from generation to generation. I think that's obvious. Uh, so in that case, it's imperative that we are intentional about teaching it and, and teaching it well. Um, I, I wanted to bring Joe Welch uh, to this conversation as well to, to kind of fill in some of those holes and, and share some of the, the pieces of our conversation that, we, that we've had over the last couple of weeks about civics education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rabley and uh, all of the panelists that are here and a special thank you to all of the attendees. Uh, as, as Mr. Rabley shared, these are the conversations that, that we think need to happen uh, to, to make effective incremental and meaningful change in civics education to, to really make a difference for our students, both now and long-term thinking beyond just the time that they're with us in the classroom. And uh, I know Mr. Radley alluded to Act 35, uh, but I, I think the story also goes back to, you know, what are the Pennsylvania social studies standards and what are the standards that are in effect uh, really for, for our students? And, and to do that, we actually have to go back to 2002 uh, to see what, are, uh, what is actually the law in, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, what is it that we are um, as supposed to be using as our guardrails if you will, of, of what we're going to be moving forward with. We have recommendations from 2009 as far as our standards, and those are uh, what's in our, our PDE standard aligned system. Um, but really standards, uh, they're, obviously they're important and recommendations are important. Um, but to really, and I don't mean this with any um, shock and awe, if you will, but it's a conversation that I had recently with somebody that's my, one of my best friends that teaches down the hall. He teaches math. And he walked up to me and to, he, he stated this. He said, I teach math. I have a test. My subject matters. And he's one of my best friends that said that to me. And so that gave me ultimate pause of if this is the view that's out there, we cannot let this go forward. Obviously, I think everybody that's here would 100% agree that civics education is vital. And so that really opened my eyes to a problem that is a prioritization problem. And Mr. Rabley alluded to that. When we talk about how can we move forward in prioritizing civics education, um, and we're talking about class sizes and class time and staff resources, and even just the view of social sciences, how can we take our view that civics education is essential and bring that to everybody? or at least expand the field of who characterizes that as significant. So how do we open that up? How do we open that dialogue uh, to really meet those expectations that civics is essential? And, and, and as I said, we can all uh, obviously agree on that. Um, so when I look at you know, the original question, how do the state standards, how do, how do those fit into our expectations? We all here realize already that the expectation is that we provide students to be engaged citizens. But how do we broaden that landscape? How do we make it a priority, not just in the civics classroom, not just in your social studies classroom, but in every classroom? Because we see it with math, we see it with STEM, we see it with ELA, and I'm not going to cut them down at their knees you know, to say, oh, we need to bring civics up. I think we all need to be on that every content area. And I'm going to say that civics is the, 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 the backbone of, of all of those other content areas. So that's the expectation. And, and that's what I'm excited to see the dialogue. How do we bring that forward to all classrooms throughout the entire school day? All right, thank you, Mr. Welch and Mr. Rabley. Some, um, some interesting points about priorities and, and balance. And, um, you know, it's a good tee up for uh, Mr. Heinrich, who actually has responsibilities in achieving that balance in some way. He's a curriculum director, um, as we said, for the Indiana uh, Area School District. Um, and Mr. Heinrich, in your role as curriculum director, you have to guide the development and, and execution of the district-wide uh, curriculum. Um, 
not just for social studies, but for the other subject areas that Mr. Um, Welch uh, mentioned, eight other broad standard areas like math and science. Um, your work is a bit like an architect of the, of the building there behind you, um, uh, creating a, a, a building. So how do you see your work? And since we're discussing civics education, you were a, a civics educator, um, can you talk about how you go about that building project of putting a curriculum together? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ebley. And I want to take a second to thank Dr. Zahorchak and the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown and the Rendell Center and the ISD Board of Directors for providing me the opportunity to be part of this panel tonight and you know, part of this great and very necessary conversation. Um, and it's a good analogy comparing the work that we do as district administrators to architects on a building project. You know, when you think about what it is that schools do, it's exactly that. We we build a stronger community by ensuring that our school system produces educated and capable citizens. And that's done deliberately by design, um, or it should be. Um, and it's a, it's a process, like as uh, Mr. Welsh and Mr. Rabley alluded to, the, the standards that the, uh, the state has set have prioritized other areas, and we have to balance that out. Um, as an education administrator, not only I, but all the elected officials who are chosen by the people to serve as board members, many of them on the call here tonight, are charged with creating a system that optimizes the opportunities for students to be successful and to build that system that will, will strengthen our community. Uh, and you know, making sure that that building project, in your analogy, has all the amenities our tenants might need. You know, so all the students have all the skills that they might need. So, uh, but instead of you know choosing to you know, design of the room, we're, we're laying the floor plan that will lead students to success. Um, and we do this by identifying what it is that the students need to be successful, prioritizing and balancing uh, the curricula to best meet those needs. Um, and it changes all the time, right? We have to keep up with the times. And then we need to train our teachers so that they're better equipped to address those needs. And then we hopefully measure and assess the success of our efforts and then start the process over again if, if we do it well. Um, it's interesting, many probably think that be, you know, public schools exist, free public schools is, exist as because of our democracy, uh, that there's some sort of product or privilege that resulted from the success our democracy has experienced. But it's actually the opposite of that. Schools, public schools in America exist as a means to, of, to sustaining our democracy. When Thomas Jefferson argued for the establishment of free public schools back in the 1770s, he knew that in order for our self-government to be sustainable, we needed an educated electorate, citizens who in his words, knew their rights and understand their duties. And you know, so as the architects of our community, as you said, we, we are gonna, if we're going to successfully build a system that produces educated and capable, capable electors, electorates, uh, we need to move society forward in the 21st century. There are three critical pieces that we need to ensure that are instilled in every one of our students. And that's the abundance of knowledge, the necessary skills, and the right mindset. And to ensure that the students graduate with the knowledge they need, we need to create a robust curriculum that builds the knowledge in a variety of subjects, as you pointed out, from pre-K all the way to grade 12, I saw in the question uh, um, uh, someone had asked, why is civics not taught until junior high school? Why, why is it not taught in pre-K? And, and she's right, it should be. It absolutely should be. If the system is going to be effective, it needs to start in that foundation as early as possible uh, and then flow through a logical progression where you know, new knowledge builds on knowledge already learned. Um, so we need to make sure that you know, we put those things in place. We also need to ensure the students have the skills necessary to navigate our democracy uh, and move our society forward. We need to provide students with as many opportunities as possible to practice those skills. Like Mr. Rabley was talking about the, you know, the model UN or debate simulations, hands-on learning experiences in the community, as many you know, opportunities to practice those skills as possible. You know, when I taught civics and government you know, 10 years ago, well, 12 years ago, I remember that the unit on the role of the media was the shortest instructional unit of the year, and we'd blow through it in a week. And now you look at the civil unrest across our nation, and I truly believe that most of the problems that we're facing are 
direct results of misunderstandings caused by a breakdown of communication caused by a lack of these skills. You know, the media has evolved so quickly over the last 10 years, it's completely changed the political landscape. Our education system needs to change with society. Uh, you know, the effect of media and government should now really be its own course rather than the shortest unit of the year. So our graduates can enter their adult world armed with the tools necessary to digest this information that's being fired at them at you know, unbelievable speeds. You know, we need to teach them to recognize bias. We need to teach them to seek out valid sources of information, to think critically for themselves, to consider all perspectives in a situation and truly seek to understand before they decide their own you know, position on a matter. And we need to teach them how to think, not what to think. Teachers are incredibly powerful people with tremendous responsibility, and we should be part of the solution, not part of the problem. No student should ever know whether a teacher is a Democrat or a Republican or for something or against something. Teachers should always be playing devil's advocate and challenging students to seek true understanding and, and push their knowledge further of a situation before they pass judgment. We also need to be very deliberate about incorporating this social emotional learning into our curriculum. Uh, we need to you know, make connections to social emotional learning wherever there are logical connections and where better than in social studies, you know, the portion of our curriculum, it studies how people and systems interact to move society forward or backward. Um, you know, students should be encouraged to identify the emotions that are evoked when they read a news headline or when they hear a politician speak or when they're confronted with an opposing viewpoint and they should practice identifying where those emotions come from and then how to use those emotions for good. You know, so we can disagree in an agreeable manner. You know, the world needs passionate people who are, you know, willing to fight to change things for the better, but uncontrolled emotions are very dangerous. You know, the validation can turn to delusion and, you know, sadness can turn to depression, anger can turn to rage. And it's extremely rare that anything good ever came from delusion, depression, or rage. And in addition to the knowledge and the skills necessary for success, we have to instill the right mindset in our students. And this is possibly the most critical piece of all. We should create opportunities for our students to engage in improving their community. And I think Act 35 got it right when it talked about this. It needs to really provide them opportunities to serve their community, understand what community really, need, really means, and so that they understand that they're responsible for the stewardship of their community and they're responsible for the stewardship of our democracy and our society. You know, so you know, public education, uh, as the mission of public education hasn't changed since uh, the 1780s, although a lot of other things have, obviously. So our job is to build a system that maximizes the potential for student outcomes. Um, so, systems, so great teachers like Mr. Radley and Mr. Welsh can do great things and in, to inspire students to change the world, and at the very least to navigate our society effectively. We need to teach our children to listen to communicate effectively, to love and respect their country and the freedoms that they've been awarded, but to understand where they come from and understand that they themselves are responsible for nurturing those freedoms and maintaining them. And when we you know, look at the situation through that lens, civics and government education might be the most important subject in the curriculum because uh, our democracy can't survive without it. And, and that's why I'm really happy that we're having this discussion here tonight and yeah, I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Heinrich. As a political science professor and as an uh, engaged citizen, it's reassuring to um, hear those kind of comments from somebody who's responsible for, you know, supervising and implementing uh, curriculum across the uh, public school district there. And to hear the comments from our two teachers also about uh, the importance of prioritizing uh, civics education, not just in the civics classroom in, in eighth grade. Um, let's change pace a little bit at this point. We'll move to introduce two leaders who are known across the country and beyond, um, two people who have led from two different branches of, of government at every uh, level of government, um, from the mayor's office to the governor's office to the, uh, to the courthouse. I want to remind uh, Governor Rundell that 18 years ago when he was first running in the primary elections uh, for the governor's race, he pulled up in a blue Rendell for governor bus here in the parking lot right outside the building that I'm sitting in here at Pitt Johnstown. And he stood in my classroom, uh, spoke to my class upstairs in, in, uh, in Krebs Hall back then. 
And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that he made a stop at Pitt Johnstown and then went on to win. So, um, so, so it was good for us that he came here. I think it was good for him that he came here as well. Um, before starting a conversation with the Rendells, um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce a video highlighting uh, a national project that's uh, going on in our state through the Rendell Center uh, and their project for civics and civic engagement. asked them to submit an essay. We grade the essays and we pick the 10 best, and boy, is that hard. But it's not quite as hard as when we pick the 10 best, they'll come down to the National Constitution Center and make oral presentations for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we sit as judges. Judge Rendell, myself, some board members, sometimes Joe, Joe, uh, Jeff Rosen, the head of the Constitution Center, we ask them questions. We challenge their knowledge. We challenge their arguments. The responses we got, the skits that were put on by those kids, not only for the first year for that challenge, but for, for the subsequent four or five challenges, were nothing short of amazing. And the kids are very creative, too. The winning entry closed their argument, and they took the tougher side of the argument, which was if the Constitution shouldn't be changed, then naturalized citizens shouldn't have the right to run for president. They based it on his, the historic arguments that were put forth when the, that provision of the Constitution was debated. But they closed their 15-minute presentation by playing Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA. <laughs> I thought that was so cute. They got my vote no matter what. It's just amazing to see how excited they are. Excited about civics, excited about government. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jackson Hart, and this is Miko Carpinello. We are here with students from Kinwood Elementary School, and they have come to talk about term limits. The fifth grade challenge group strongly thinks that there should be term limits imposed on Congress and Supreme Court justices. Let's talk to some of the students and hear their thoughts. Joel, what do you think about imposing term limits? I think we should definitely have term limits because new people can mean new ideas which will help improve our country. And do you also support term limits, Gwen? I think we must impose term limits. It will make people work harder and make the most of their time in office if they only have a limited time to serve. And what do you feel is the most important reason for amending the Constitution to impose term limits, Gabe? I think we should impose term limits because the balance of power requires it. If the president has term limits, why shouldn't Congress and Supreme Court justices? Shouldn't they have the same amount of power? To share our message and let our voices be heard, we will now perform a song. My students learn the way we work, uh, the way the government works, the way the courtroom works, 
They also learn civic responsibility. They learn what a jury is. They learn what a judge does. They learn what civil and what criminal means. They learn what a bailiff does. And they also get a chance to see all the job opportunities that may be available to them in the future. Maybe they might want to grow up to be an attorney or a judge or, or perhaps even a bailiff. So all of this comes into play when we do mock trials in our classrooms. The students learn so much from a literature-based mock trial. In sixth grade, working together is kind of a difficult thing, and they have to work on questioning and, and working together as a, as a group or as a team. And this is sort of interesting. They, they don't always get the side that they want. They have to argue a side that they might not believe in, but it teaches really good critical thinking strategies and being able to argue a different side and being able to think of something from a different point of view. And then there's also just to have the knowledge of how a trial works and what happens, who, who are the people in a trial, who are the people in a, in a courtroom situation. And another thing that kids will really be able to work on and learn during a literature-based mock trial is their communication skills. They'll be working on their listening skills because they'll have to listen to each other and listen to what the characters are saying and what they're coming up with in their questions, be able to write all of the things that they have to do. They have to be able to communicate out loud to someone else and be able to use those communication skills. So communication is a huge part of learning in a literature-based mock trial. We're getting the best and the brightest teachers who really care about civics and who understand the need to impart to our young people a sense of understanding about civics and, the, again, their rights and responsibilities as citizens. Teachers volunteer for this program, and we get applications from almost every one of the 50 states. We can only take 40 teachers in the summer program, and we pay for their room and board. They have to pay for their transportation, and yet we get teachers who apply for the program from California, from Hawaii, from Florida, from Oregon, places like that. So we wanted to inspire teachers, and I wish we had money to do more than 40 teachers. We agonize every year because we get far more applicants than 40. My hope is one day we can give this program, what the center does, to other cities and other regions, and they can replicate it. Because I would like to see a lot of what we do adopted nationally. This institute is helping teachers and educators look at all the range of possibilities for civic engagement so we can take it back to our, our students and understand how we can get them engaged. It is so phenomenal to gather teachers together from all over the United States. They connect with each other and they just raise the bar higher and higher for what we expect from educators. And we're glad that we can inspire them. You can take the Rendell Center's work and expand it and replicate it all across the country. I think we could produce a different generation of kids coming into adulthood with a different attitude towards government, politics, and citizenship. And to me, it's the most important thing I can do with the rest of my life. That was great and um, really um, showed off what the Rendell Center is doing and, and in a lot of ways answered some questions that we asked already about resources that, uh, that teachers need. And I see in the uh, Q&A uh, app down here that there's a lot of good questions and comments that are, that are uh, rolling in. Um, Governor Rendell and Judge Rendell, you both are uh, longtime insiders and I say that not in a pejorative way. But, you know, we, 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 we celebrate the outsider these days, but we need the insiders. Both of you are insiders with long careers in public service, um, yet you look out at a political landscape today that's in a bit of turmoil. Many young people especially don't think that politics and government are relevant to them. Uh, they see a system that's not designed to make room for their voices. I hear that in my own classroom. From the inside, do you think that the system is open to young people, to young voices, um, and what are the, the events of the past few months um, shown you about the need to be open to them and the need for civics education? And I'll, I'll start off with Governor Rendell. Well, we decided, Ed and I decided that I'd take the first part about the youth voices. And I think from the video you just saw, 
uh, and, and also uh, Mr. Heinrich's remarks, we need to get them young. We need to encourage them to use their voices. Too often they are taught to the test and they're taught to a multiple choice and, and we don't listen to them. We need to tell them they can use their voices for good. Uh, look at Greta Thunberg, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for talking out about the environment. Look at the Parkland youngsters talking out about gun violence. When, when the youth speak, we do listen. Now, very often we listen to the shrillest voice as, as we know, but when the youth use their common sense and are encouraged to speak, and, and, and use their voices, we, we do listen to them. I'm so impressed when we do the literature-based mock trial, how they have so much common sense. Uh, I, you, I take the juries out when we have these mock trials and I run them through the exercise of, you know, who do you believe? Who do you think, you know, give me the pros and cons. They have such common sense. They're not jaded. Uh, you know, and we, there are youth voices and then there are youth voices. The millennials, the 22 to 38 year old, we may have lost them. 25% of them think that democracy is not the way to run the country, but they're thinking about it as politics. We need to focus on the fact that we have government and we have branches of government and they function and they function very well. And we need to, to teach the student about that. Uh, the difference between teaching a, or listening to a fifth grader versus an eighth grader. Um, I talked to fifth graders, they raise their hands, they're so excited. By the time they get to adolescence, sometimes we've lost them. They look at me like, why, why are you telling me this? I have so many things on my mind. We need to get them young. Uh, I'm convinced that the, the youths that we talk to in the mock trials, these youngsters, they're gonna be voting. They know what it's about. They will be engaged, but we need to encourage them to hear and use their own voice. Um, with respect to the past few months, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Ed. Uh, I am encouraged that we, we've learned about what the courts can do and what the courts do do. They're open to citizens. They, they hear, they decide cases based on evidence. Um, we have secretaries of state in the voting process who did their duties. Uh, I mean, a lot of our, the recent turmoil uh, is also com uh, combined with a lot of recent examples of ex excellent uh, you know, the civics lessons, if you will. Governor, I'll turn it to you. Well, I think uh, the judge made some very good points. In all the turmoil and all of the discouraging things that happened in the last two or three months, the one thing we should be most encouraged about is that our constitution worked. Constitution is based, uh, gave us a government based on the balance of power, balance of power between three branches of government and it's amazing how many Americans can't name the three branches of government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. And the balance of power means that no one branch can control the government. And we saw when the executive wanted to control the government that the legislature didn't do anything to stop them, but the judiciary held. And the judiciary performed to the best best elements of the American democracy. Judges, whether they were appointed by Republican presidents or Democratic presidents, they did the right thing and universally denied these false claims of uh, a fraudulent election. 62 cases were decided by the courts, different federal courts and a few state courts. And in 61 of the 62, the Republican president's efforts to take the election and throw it out was denied mostly by Republican judges. So democracy held. There was a time when we weren't sure it would hold. And I thought it was particularly meaningful, should have been to people, that the three Republican Supreme Court judges that the president has had the opportunity to appoint in three separate and different occasions voted unanimously against the president's point of view. That's the way the American democracy works. And there's hardly a judiciary in the world that works with that degree of independence. Secondly, as to the youth themselves, I was extremely encouraged by the, but the judge said he should quote a discouraging statistic, what 22 to 39 year olds think about democracy. But on the other hand, 18 to 29 year olds, more generation X than millennials, they voted at the highest participation rate in a presidential election 
in a long time. And then the Georgia special election that determined who was gonna control the U US Senate. <clears throat> there was a huge turnout of 18 to 29 year olds. That turnout in a special election had never been half as high as it was in that Georgia election. And in Georgia, in the presidential election, Vice President Biden defeated President Trump by less than 12,000 votes in a very large state, which had over a million votes. Well, the turnout of 18 to 29 year olds was 20% of the overall election. Nationwide, the turnout of 18 to 29 year olds was 17% of the overall vote. If in Georgia, only 17% of the young people constituted only 17% of the vote, Vice President Biden would have lost the state of Georgia. So young people made the difference between who won and who lost a very important, very large electoral voting state. So I think young people did very well in this election. They took it seriously. They came out and they voted. They voted for their future. And as, as Mitch said, fifth graders are less jaund jaundiced and eight graders less cynical but 18 to 29 year old voters tend to still be less cynical than older voters they can make a huge difference in a democracy and they're starting to feel their oats and that's something we can feel very good about judge do you want to follow up on that at all well one thing i'd also like to mention is uh, i don't know that people realize that our government recently has been decided in the executive branch and I don't say that as a matter of Trump or Biden or Obama, but you see these executive orders. And the reason their executive orders are, are being signed is because Congress really isn't functioning. So that our, we're, we're leaving our, our Congress really to one person, uh, whether it is a Biden or an Obama or, or a Trump. Uh, and I think a lot of people just don't realize that our government is just not functioning as it should. And part of that has to do with the electorate, with the electorate taking taking their uh, representatives to task for not compromising and not doing things that they should be doing. I mean, compromise is a basic principle of our democracy, the Missouri Compromise. I mean, that's the way our, our government got started through compromise. And we need our, 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 uh, our voters to take our Congress people to task uh, for these, these strident positions that don't reach against the aisle. So that's something that's developed over the last several years that we're just taking for granted. But people need, again, those critical thinking skills. Is our government working the way it should? No. What are we going to do about it? So that's something that I see that, that dismays me that people don't realize that we need to take our legislators to task. You know, uh, Dr. Zahorchak's class right now is class on education, law and policy and, and ethics. Uh, those students are... Um, are examining exactly that. They're, they're gonna be in school systems that are governed by and regulated by um, legislative acts like Act 35 or by um, you know, executive issue regulations out of PDE or by the decisions of, of, of courts. And so they are getting an understanding of the role of legislatures, uh, courts and the executive branch and, and the role of you know everything from the school board to the Harrisburg to Washington DC the different the different levels of government, um, and and those are teachers coming out of Dr. Zorchak's class that won't just be civics teachers. But I wonder how important is it in your view that that every teacher, not just civics and government teachers, has a good understanding of how our democracy works, of how that system that Judge Rendell just described, how that works. So how is important? How important is it? that all of the teachers across the disciplines uh, understand how democracy works and, and why. Well, I think some of the comments by the people who, the panel members who've, who have uh, preceded us pointed that out. I mean, these critical thinking skills are not limited to, uh, to civics education and the content. It is this uh, skill set and it is this mindset that can be, uh, can't come to bear in every class. Uh, you know, teachers are supposed to prepare our youth for adulthood and adulthood is citizenship, uh, the rights and responsibilities. So it really, really is important. But I think, you know, challenging the students, encouraging them to hear their voice, pushing back on them, making them critical uh, thinkers, 
uh, have them debate issues, have different viewpoints, uh, you know, whether it's social studies, math, literacy, weave civics values into the literacy. The literacy component should not be, you know, Jane and John at Spot the dog. It should be, um, you know, Johnny goes to Congress or, uh, you know, what are my rules? Uh, something that teaches about basic, the basics. So I think every, every teacher is uh, a, a civics teacher and teachers are the most influential people, you know, apart from our parents or mentors, teachers are the most influential people in, the, in our lives. We look back and we remember those teachers who, who taught us the basics and encouraged us to speak and have views, um, you know, and inculcating fairness and freedom, tolerance, equality, respect, public engagement. These happen in every classroom. Uh, so every teacher does need to know uh, the basics. Governor, you want to follow up on that at all? Well, I think the judge got it right. Uh, but I would also say that, you know, kids are going to ask questions not just in civics classes. If something happened like the assault on the Capitol on January 6th, I would imagine a lot of teachers got questions by their kids the next day, whether they were math teachers or English teachers or homo teachers or whatever. So I think all of our teachers should have a working knowledge of, uh, of civics and, and what makes our government right. And not only the rights were granted under the constitution, but the responsibilities that go with that. And I will say in our, in our surveys we conducted over the years in the Rendell Center, uh, a lot of teachers felt that they really weren't prepared to do this. They, they didn't have the content knowledge, uh, which, is, which is challenging. But these days there is a lot of knowledge that is available. I hate to say it on the web, but I mean, you can find sources, uh, original sources that tell you about the Electoral College and tell you it's okay for electors to object. Uh, but we should encourage students to do their own research and find out about these things as well. Um, and it is challenging, especially something like that, the electors. We, we had one of our uh, citizen challenge based upon the Electoral College saying, should it be abolished? And it happened to be the, the year that uh, President Trump won the Electoral College and didn't win the popular vote. So it was extremely interesting to have the students, but they did research. They went back and figured out why did the founding fathers start the Electoral College? Uh, and and they came up with reasons why it should be continued or why they felt it shouldn't be continued. Um, you, they can find these things out and they need to be encouraged to do so. So even if the teachers just say, well, that's a good question. Why don't you go research that and we'll talk about it tomorrow in school. Now, I think another thing that teachers have some uh, understanding of, and I know again, in Dr. Zorchek's class, they're, they're learning about it. It's not just about the electoral college or separation of powers, but about the rights that students have both in, in school and, and out of school. And I know that the, the students um, you know, here at the Johnstown are um, learning about the significant cases that, that uh, courts have decided regarding the uh, rights of students, um, including the, the recent Pennsylvania case of Mahoney Area School District versus BL. And I wonder, Judge, again, whether you can make some comments about those cases shaping um, the rights that students have in, in school and, and again, what teachers need to, to know about that. Yeah, well, I don't wanna get too thick into the weeds, but uh, it's a really interesting line of cases and I love teaching it. And very often in our teachers institute, I will come in and teach this, these cases, um, starting really at Tinker versus Des Moines in 1969. It's interesting, the courts didn't wrestle with a lot of these issues. Um, until this date was the Vietnam War and students were protesting and the, the school superintendents uh, suspended, uh, uh, the principal suspended students who wouldn't remove the armbands um, protesting the war, fearing that they were disruptive. Well, the Supreme Court said, uh, you know, the students' rights don't end at the schoolyard gate uh, unless there's clear evidence of disruption, uh, you can't silence the students. So told the school what they could and couldn't do. Uh, and thereafter, the whole series of cases, uh, one having to do with uh, an obscene uh, remarks by a student in an assembly, in a school-sponsored assembly, and the courts held that that student uh, could be suspended. Uh, it was kind of a captive audience. It was in the school. It was uh, not appropriate, if you will, for the school environment. So it was, and it was disruptive in a, in a broader sense. So disruption has been the, the, the key over the years. If it is disruptive, 
uh, the schools can do something about it. But uh, in 2007, case Morse versus Frederick, where the students had a big uh, sign they rolled out during a school-sponsored parade saying bong hits for Jesus, which was viewed by the court as promoting illegal drug use. So the school could in fact censor the speech. Uh, and that was really the last case that the Supreme Court took. Uh, and it was my view that the Supreme Court has kind of said, listen, these schools have a tough time. These administrators, they have their hands full. We're not gonna dabble in what they can and can't do. Let's just you know let them let them do what they do, and you know it's a, it's very difficult with bullying and everything. And I do understand the teachers have their hands full, but but the Supreme Court just took uh, granted cert in the Pennsylvania case where a student had had a uh, a Snapchat or a picture of herself uh, with an expletive uh, expletive cheerleading expletive softball, and she posted this on Snapchat, which of course went viral. Uh, she wasn't on school property, it wasn't during school time, and uh, she was suspended. But my court, the Third Circuit, basically said that tinker, the idea of disruption, has no place when you're talking about off-campus, non-school-sponsored speech. Um, so, and we, we, put a, we drew a line saying off-campus. Of course, with social media these days, off campus, is this a physical boundary? Um, so it'll be interesting, the Supreme Court took cert and it's gonna decide, you know, what are the parameters? Is it off campus, on campus? Is it disruption? Uh, what is it? Of course, we left open the fact that if there were threatenings of uh, violence threatened or harassment, uh, but this was expressing an opinion uh, that, and although there was a school rule that you're not supposed to be disrespectful, um, we held that the student had not uh, waived her First Amendment rights. So it's very interesting. It's interesting, but I am challenged, uh, or I think teachers must be challenged to figure out, and certainly, you know, principals and superintendents, okay, what is the line that I'm supposed to draw here? Uh, this is wrong. Uh, it went viral. Um, can I do this? Can I not? And they have to wait for the courts to speak. It is, I think, it's extremely challenging for the schools in, in this environment, especially with social media. Uh, but the courts, you know, the cases come and the courts deal with it, and, uh, you know, Teachers have to have to understand these these principles as as uh, kind of difficult as they can be, uh, but we'll see what the Supreme Court says about off-campus speech and what are the bounds. Interesting case, Governor. Do you want to comment on that at all? No, I just listening to the judge speak. I remember we had a state court judge, and state courts have different responsibilities than federal courts, and it's considered to be a higher position to be appointed to the federal courts than it is to the state courts. And Judge McGlynn was a state court judge who for his last five years as a state court judge tried nothing but murder cases. He was appointed to the federal bench and one month after he took the bench, we had a ceremony congratulating him. And for that month, he had been a federal judge. And he said, I heard when I took this position that it was a much more important position so far, I, who for five years decided murder cases, I've been deciding what's the appropriate length of a student's haircut. <laughs> the constitutional right to express yourself through your hair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Governor, the, um, the extent to which we emphasize and prioritize civic education in, in varies from state to state and to some extent. Um, governors have some role in providing some type of of leadership ultimately in, in, in seeing to it that you have quality civics education in a particular uh, state. What, do you, as a governor, a former governor, what do you think that governors can do at the state level? What, what, how can you convince other governors to prioritize that? Um, and, and, and is there a, a role for the federal government to, to mandate to, uh, to the state something regarding civics education? Well, again, it goes to the fact that education is basically the responsibility of the state and the local communities. The federal government participates through its funding of things like special education programs. But the federal government doesn't have much say in what goes into education. That's in the province of each state. And each state can be completely different. So, for example, one of the things we tried to do when I was uh, governor is we tried to get a civics test that had to be passed by a student in Pennsylvania, a high school student, before that student graduated. 
I would have thought that, that was a very reasonable request, reasonable requirement, and something that would promote the students from learning basic rights and responsibilities. But it was defeated by the legislature because each community said, we don't want the states telling us what each school district, what are the requirements for successful graduation. And it's always a constant battle between local control. And when I became governor, I heard you're violating the rights of local control. And that wasn't just on civics, it was on a lot of things. You remember when Jud, uh, Jeb Bush, President Bush, uh, uh, his brother was governor of Florida. He was a Republican governor, but a very good governor. And he stressed education during his two terms as governor. And he adopted something which he went before the National Governors Association and convinced 48 governors to adopt these standards. They were called, the standards were described as common core standards. And they were basic standards that every student had to be able to pass before he or she graduated. And 48 states out of 50 adopted them. Democratic states with Democratic governors, Republican states with Republican governors. Well, then it became a sort of a cause celeb and conservative forces said, no, you're violating the right of local control. Uh, Florida's state government shouldn't dictate to our school districts. Pennsylvania state government shouldn't dictate to our school districts. And at the end of this sort of counterattack, all but about eight states had reduced common core standards, had eliminated. So it's a very difficult test between the tradition of common school districts deciding things that govern the way their kids are, are, are educated, disciplined, and the state, not even forget the federal government and the state. So it is difficult, but it is something that I think is worth doing. We ought to have common standards. The quality of a young person's education, we always say, we hear the phrase, shouldn't be controlled by the zip code they live in. That's usually applied to the monetary uh, money that a school district can spend, whether it's in a rich area where there's a good property tax base or a poor area. Well, it's, I believe the quality of a student's education shouldn't be decided by what state they live in as well. So I would like to see more national standards based on science. There's a science of education, just like there's a science of everything else. And the science of education has demonstrated some things that are universally accepted. Those things should be made of common standards. Now, ironically, President Bush, the younger President Bush, he didn't develop No Child Left Behind, which had some specific standards that state had, states had to meet. It was very controversial, but he combined with something that probably wouldn't be happening today. He got Ted Kennedy, Senator Ted Kennedy, probably the leading Democrat in the Senate to endorse the No Child Left Behind program. And it was adopted by the Congress. It had some success, but generally fell under the weight of uh, proper implementation. But we, but we do still have the standardized testing uh, that has such financial ramifications. And, and that really is a difficulty. And Florida has great ed civics education, but it came at a cost. There's a lot of teacher training. It imposed new requirements on teachers, um, imposing new requirements on teachers and budgetary considerations. Very tough to get, get things through that, that are gonna have those additional burdens uh, on the states. Let, let me, um, before we look at some questions here that have come in, let me just throw it back to the teachers then. Um, you know, uh, states can mandate uh, that they implement standards or they uh, demonstrate outcomes in, in the classroom uh, and um, school boards and school districts. And ultimately, teachers have to navigate that. And I just want to throw it back to Mr. Welch and Mr. Rabley. Um, what, can, what can teachers do? What can citizens do? But what can teachers do themselves to take action to improve civics education and civics engagement? And maybe, Mr. Welch, you can start. Sure. 
so when I think about Act 35, and I think of Act 35 is really is the prologue. It's the, and I think uh, Mr. Rabley referred to it as a good starting point. It opens us uh, to that conversation. And I think, is it perfect? No. Does it need to be improved? Absolutely. And, and I think in my head, legislatively right now, realistically, are we in an environment to completely transform Act 35 into, and I see a comment that came through in the Q&A, to make it more measurable and meaningful and not just measurable, but what is the long-term impact of Act 35 and what should it be? And I think, what are the incremental, if we're not looking at you know, sweeping changes legislatively, how can we slowly move the needle to where it should be? You know, how it's set up right now, a seventh grader in District A and a 12th grader in District B can be taking their assessments and if we have two different people, two different groups of students at two different school dif districts at two different, again, locally controlled, how is that a measurable, meaningful impact? Whereas how could we shift that to take that seventh grader and have them civically engaged and do something else with them in eighth grade and in ninth grade and in 10th grade and in 11th grade all the way through? What would be the more meaningful task or meaningful uh, experience for those students to not just have a singular one-off test. Uh, oh, yeah. it, it... You're absolutely right. I mean, in No Child Left Behind, the uh, tests were designed to be given to third graders, fifth graders, and eighth graders, and with the theory being that they tested kids at, at seminal years of the progression of their education third, two years later in the fifth, three years later in the eighth. And I would just like to mention, I don't know if teachers realize it, but there's a resource out there. It's called Judges and Lawyers. They are more than happy, anxious to come in and share their knowledge. Constitution Day, Bill of Rights Day, one day every month come in and help you. They would love to do it. So you don't need to train yourself. Um, Go, call the Bar Association and align yourself with a lawyer or a judge. Have, have a, a lawyer or a judge be your, you know, your mascot every year. Uh, change every year and get a different lawyer, a different judge to come in and help you. I don't think it's true that students are apathetic about, about civic engagement these days. And um, when I hear and I see young activists fighting for gun-free streets and lead-free schools and and cleaner environment, you know that there's passion there. But unfortunately, when you ask them where did your, what inspired you to be involved, it's things like TikTok and Instagram and people connecting themselves and they don't connect it with their civics classes. They don't say, I learned this in civics class. Um, and that's what's missing. I'm looking at Kevin's comment here about what Joe just addressed about the, the shortfall of, of a test. and and the different ways that that can be manipulated. He said, why not a project-based assessment with common metrics? I think about how teachers are evaluated and, and here's the model, here's the framework, show us the evidence that you've met it. And if we could create a framework for civics readiness, prove to us that you've satisfied these things through action year after year with your students. I think that would be excellent. Um, sorry, I lost my, lost my, my next thought there. Good point. Joe? No, that's 100% correct. In, in fact, simply, can we look to other content areas that have already done this? Career readiness already happens in Pennsylvania, right? Giving students the opportunity to interact with the community, with community leaders, with business owners. And that's how, that, that's meaningful impact. And, but also not just meaningful impact, that's how we're giving students diverse experiences. You know, we, we can't, if, if hopefully when we can move to a pathway that involves this project-based uh, systemic learning, that it's not just a student, Johnny, always going to the fire hall every year. Okay, that might be one year, but how can you engage with a civil, uh, 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 a, um, a lawyer, or how, do you, how can you uh, engage with somebody that's across the town in a different zip code to, to get that diverse view or, or that, that 
more equitable view of, of the entire gamut of what it means to be a citizen. And, and I think back to the Abigail Adams quote, you know, uh, it, it, the measure of intelligence is, is how many conflicting different points of view you can, you can have at, at the same time. And, and that's really, that's what we need. Like, how can we inspire that? And, and to just go on Christian's point there, that making it project-based and meaningful project-based learning, uh, we can look to the other areas, other content areas that have had success with it, and how can we bring this to civics education in Pennsylvania? Well, I think one of the things that we found is that the best way to teach civics is through something called experiential learning. It's one thing to hear it, teacher lecture on the, the jury system and on the independence of the judiciary. But it's another thing for the students to actually be a juror in a trial, in a mock trial, for a, a young person to be a lawyer representing Goldilocks, who's charged with breaking and entering. Uh, it, it, it's, if they experience things, they're never gonna forget them. We see these kids doing the citizenship challenge and you, you saw in the film, a little bit about that. But you see these kids and they are so animated and so into it, it is unbelievable. They won't forget it. They won't forget what their rights are as a citizen. They won't forget about voting. They won't forget about writing their legislature. And better still, they won't forget about the possibility of them running for office someday. We need more citizen soldiers in our democracy. We need more citizen soldiers to run for office. And if we can promote that feeling in young people, it's, it's a great feeling. You know, and the Model UN, I've spoken at, uh, and judged at a number of Model UNs, and it's great to see the students get into it and advocate for a position. Just the advocacy for a position, that in and of itself is such a great learning experience. So I think we have to do some traditional learning but some experiential learning. And that's why I was so glad one of the things we did when I was governor is the program to bring smart boards and computers into the classroom so the kids could learn it in, in, in a different way. Um, and I remember when we were doing the classrooms of the future, we got strong opposition from a lot of the legislators and yet, when the programs proved to be successful and popular with not only the kids, but the parents, those legislators showed up and took credit for the program, <laughs> which is not a unique uh, stance for legislators to take. Um, uh, thank you, Governor. I just wanted to add uh, a few observations to the discussion, but this time from a bit of a personal perspective, as you see, um, growing up in Africa and thinking about the United States, the thing that at least most of us who went to elementary and, and secondary school in Africa that we heard about were really the American ideals. They were things that we aspired to. And coming to the United States as a student, um, a young person and going through that transition to become <laughs> an American citizen, it was something, it was sort of like the, it was like a beacon that was something that I aspired to and something that I, as a lawyer, I later on taught constitutional law. And I thought about it from the sense that I almost const, uh, from contracted and accepted the, and took the test and thought about it. And I feel looking back that that process of trying to become a citizen and, and sort of you know, working on everything from the language to learning the history and the politics and the government, and later on even going to law school and becoming a constitutional law professor, that journey had a kind of intentionality and a kind of hunger attached to it that sometimes I think citizens, uh, unfortunately, the thing that you get for free that, you know, you don't have to give any what lawyers call consideration or any value or any detriment. Sometimes you just kind of ignore it. You take it for granted. And that's what I fear. And if I could just, as I reflect on all of this, almost pose the question, how do we make sure that the people who got it 
without having to cross the Rio Grande or travel across oceans and give up family and everything they knew and all that risk. How do we ensure that the citizens recognize how precious and what an incredible gift it is and how many people would give up everything just to be called an American citizen? We should televise naturalization ceremonies. They are the most awe-inspiring events when you look out and see the joy on the faces. And one of the, one of the new citizens speaks and talks about going to the mailbox day after day. And then that, that letter comes and everybody's eyes light up that day that you got your letter. Uh, I couldn't, people don't understand. Yes, yes Judge, yes. And I would echo the judge, your narrative that you just shared, that's the narrative that I want my students to hear. That's inspiring to students. Right. And I think we everybody, have, as we sat here, we, I think we all had a smile on our face because- We have classes that come to our naturalization ceremony and they all should, they all should. I know that we have a, a bunch of people still with us in attendance. I know that people had some questions. I don't know if you had a chance to Either, yeah, uh, I went through some of them, and I, I'll tie in one, and we'll open it to the panelists in general. One that kind of follows up on this train of thought, and it's how do we account for the disparities in value that different citizens place on civics education? Civics should empower citizens. How do we account for those who've been marginalized by society and as well place little value in civic participation? So how do we get those groups engaged? Sort of a tie on this question we have you know, of course, seen a nationalization, but is there something else that we could do to engage the different people who have given up on civics education? That's a very good question. <laughs> we need to, we need to, we need their attention first, and then we need to make them think about it, make them think about what we have here that's important. And, you know, if you don't value, you've been given a gift. If you don't take care of it, you can lose it. And I think we're seeing that as we see the executive branch uh, getting stronger and stronger, um, your democracy is being eroded and people don't realize they've got to wake up and, and, and think about it and, and, uh, and realize it's important. Uh, I mean, teachers to kind of create that, that energy, if you will. And you need teachers to, to tell people, even if they've had a tough go of it, what combining with other people and pushing for things you believe in that need to be changed, how you can be successful. Too many people say, oh, I'm not gonna vote, it doesn't matter. One vote's not gonna change anything. Well, I always tell people who say that, I tell them about the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was ended not by legislators, not by governors, not by senators, not even by the president. It was ended by college students. In 1968, college students went out and organized to end the Vietnam War. And they went up to New Hampshire and they knocked on doors. They dressed in ties and jackets, got haircuts, looked like human beings. And they knocked on doors and they campaigned for Gene McCarthy, who was running on a program that he would pull US troops out of Vietnam. And Gene McCarthy ran against the incumbent president, Lyndon Johnson. He got 41% of the vote. And based on that, Lyndon Johnson knew that he couldn't get reelected. And he announced the next, or two days later, he announced that he wasn't running again for president. So they toppled an incumbent president who three years before it got elected with almost 100% of the electoral votes. They toppled him just by their own action, just by getting out there and knocking door to door and exercising their rights as citizens to speak up. Amazing. And everywhere I go now, I tell students how Georgia was carried by Joe Biden because more 18 to 29 year olds voted than the average American turnout. The power that young people have, young people could be the deciding factor in virtually every election, but they've got to decide to vote not just in a presidential election, but every single election, every year, for mayor, for district attorney, for township supervisor, they've got to exercise their vote consistently. All right, Hi, thank Mr. 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 Rally. Okay, okay, I was just gonna see, see if anybody wanted to 
say something else about engaging marginalized uh, populations with civics education. Uh, well, I think, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Christian. I was gonna say two things. First, um, one of my good teacher friends said, we as school leaders are often really good at asking for student active voice, um, but we too often shut the door on student active action. And there's a, there's a reason why, and, and we relinquish our control. When I became a teacher, the guy across the hall from me, I thought he was the best teacher ever. I never heard a word out of any of the students. All the kids were buttoned up in perfect lines. I thought that guy was amazing. I thought he was you know, the, the ideal teacher until I realized that a little bit of chaos, some, you know, that's, there's good things happening. And you, when you give kids control, sure, that's going to happen. And you might come past my classroom and people might be, you know, a little bit rambunctious, but I've, I've appreciated the learning that's taking place there and, and activating kids. And we often ask them to come up with ideas and speak their voice. And then we either squash it or we steal it from them and, and take it from there. So I think administrators and teachers need to get on the same page with allowing that and talking about what that looks like. Uh, the second thing, how do we help the marginalized? We have to be very intentional. And there are lots of organizations that model that for us. Um, first one, the Hamilton Education Program. Two years ago, at this time of year, I got to bring 87 students to Pittsburgh to sit front row at the Hamilton uh, musical. And that was amazing. But that was the result of Gilder Lehrman and Ham the Hamilton Education Program saying, I want 250,000 inner city kids to get to experience this for $10, the cost of the bill that Hamilton is on. If they're not gonna pay $600 a piece for a ticket, we are being intentional about who we're creating this opportunity for. Um, and the second one, WQED, when schools closed across Pennsylvania in March, WQED stepped up and for example, our school district, 43% of students didn't have internet access or a device. We couldn't continue learning on Monday like a lot of the other um, schools who were in a better place to do that. But they said, how can we be intentional about this? 99% of the households have um, access to basic cable. Let's meet them where they're at. That's equity. Let's make sure, as we heard already, their zip code doesn't determine their outcome. So let's be intentional about creating this opportunity. So Joe and I worked on a project. We went to Pittsburgh and filmed a a broadcast, a PBS broadcast that can be accessed in 99% of households across the Commonwealth. And it comes with its standards aligned, it's cross curriculum, it involves science, civics, math, English, they're practicing real skills. That, uh, and the project that we guided students through is how do you solve a problem in your community? So that's something that can be applied to any community across the country. But the one that we guided them through was looking at blight in our city and how can we create a green space, um, finding the leaders of the city and drafting letters and proposals and, and activating kids to take ownership of their space. So uh, I think intention is, is a key word there, being intentional about who we're involving in, in these opportunities. You know, it's a shame we can't have a national initiative to make this a priority. You know, it used to be you had things like public service announcements and, you know, just say no to drugs, uh, seat belts, uh, anti-smoking. All these things have been national initiatives. I, I actually tried to get Morgan Freeman to be a spokesperson for this because um, we need we need to raise the, the level of understanding of how important this is. Uh, and if, uh, if anybody out there has any ideas, uh, I'm all ears, but... Uh, it seems to me that we just need to raise the level of, of conversation, uh, you know, and the PBS program, that's great, but we need to take that, you know, everything goes viral except all the good stuff. <laughs> we need to get the good stuff going. With, with just a couple minutes left, I, I want to give uh, Boston Bradley, who is really representing Dr. Zorchek's class in Pitt John, Johnstown student. Boston, I don't know if you have any uh, kind of reflections on sitting through uh, 90 minutes of hearing the discussion, whether you want to make a comment or ask a question yourself. Uh, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. One, I'm very thankful to be to be sitting, um, I mean, not with you guys, but of course, uh, virtually with you. And uh, I agree with so much that's, that, that was uh, said and spoke. And, and I think it is a strong initiative and one that um, 
as future educators, we need to take very serious to uh, incorporate this into all academic levels. And uh, I know we talked about how can we incorporate civics into uh, basically the whole school instead of just having focusing on just civics um, in a civics class that maybe they only have once in, in throughout high school. How can we implement it to be um, something through the community level of a school that we can continue to build on? And I think we've done a great job discussing some of those uh, ways that we can incorporate that into our schools. Dr. Zahorchak, do you want to make any comments? No. You're, you're muted. Just uh, very, very proud to be a part of uh, today's. I thought uh, uh, our guest panelists, uh, from governor to the judge, uh, our president, uh, great moderator, and, and educators, uh, Rob and Christian and Joe, um, I'm just thrilled uh, to go well beyond the expectations of, of uh, this idea of what, what can we learn, because we're going to put uh, this whole class uh, watching today in the field, and they're going to make a difference. And I hope that uh, things like the, um, uh, the fifth graders, uh, when they are making their project presentations at the Rendell Center, I see it uh, in 29 IUs. I see that rising up to competition in eight regions of uh, our Act 45 uh, pill regions, and then a statewide uh, you know, winning group. Uh, those kinds of things. We need to do more and more. I'm just pleased to, uh, to spectate today and I know my class is appreciative of, of uh, your work represented by Boston's Reflections. Thanks. Well, Dr. Zahorczyk, thank you for the opportunity for us to do this, but everyone should take a page out of your book. When you were the superintendent of the Allentown School District, you put in a curriculum that focused on respect, privacy, authority, responsibility, and we walked into one of your schools and we could sense instantly that this was a different place, a wonderful place. So you you did it. Uh, we need to take a, a page from your from your book. Thanks so much. Thanks, Judge. All right. Well, I know. I, I Dr. Spector, go ahead. Yes, just a personal privilege. I want to thank the, uh, Governor Rendell for something that we are always appreciative of of this on this campus every day. And when we talk about civics education, it ties very directly to public service. And it ties very directly to somebody who looks at in his role, looks at the whole Commonwealth, looked at the needs. He may not remember, and he certainly doesn't have to remember, but I recall sitting with him and talking to him about the health needs of this area of the rural Pennsylvania. Something that is so important right now that we're in the middle of COVID and nurses are so important. I told, he talked about the number of nurses. He asked me, enough nurses. Do you need to train more nurses in that region? I said, yes, governor. And I said, governor, we would need help. We will need support to build a nursing school. And the governor said he will talk to his folks. And I met with him. But eventually, to cut a long story short, Governor Rendell committed that he would help this region have a nursing school that would train nurses that would go into area hospitals. By rough count, since then, Governor, we have educated, since our meeting, 600 nurses who are all around us, helping people now with COVID and the pandemic. And in that meeting with you, I learned what public service that connects to community and needs of the people and responsiveness of government and somebody keeping his word and commitment to the people. It taught me a lot, but I wanted to thank you personally. I've not had a chance to meet with you again in person since, but I've been meaning to, and I wanted to use this forum to all of you out there listening. Uh, this is a model of public service that uh, is on power road and that has meant so much to this area in many ways, but especially because of that nursing building directly across from us here which he brought to being. Thank you, Governor. Well, thank you. You didn't know that at the time you were making a pitch to me, Judge Randell was chairman of the board of the Penn Nursing School. So I had no <laughs> choice but to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that a lot of uh, the people who joined us also had questions and, and again, given the nature of the kind of format that we have is a little bit difficult to do that. I know that Beth put an uh, email address in the uh, chat bar there for uh, anybody who wants, you know, 
questions to be funneled out to some of the panelists. We'll see what kind of response we can get. I just want to, again, thank everybody who took time out on a Monday afternoon to join us. I'm a politics geek. And so for me, this is an exciting thing to do and fun. Um, I hope it's true for lots of others. Um, and uh, I want to thank the Rendells for taking the time. Really uh, generous of them to share with our students and share with the people across the state um, their expertise and their perspectives at a time when we really, uh, really need, um, you know, voices, loud voices and lots of voices um, talking about the importance of civic, civics education from the, from the people doing it in the classroom to the, uh, to the halls of the legislature and the, and the, and the courtrooms um, and the university. So thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you to Beth Specker for uh, all of the logistics that went into uh, bringing this together. Uh, the panelists uh, appreciate it. Well, you guys were just uh, great to do it yourselves and great to do the things you are doing to advance civics education. Just keep it up. Keep up the great work. Mm -hmm.